I'm going to start this conversation by pulling the curtain back a little bit. Orlando, when I mentioned the possibility of joining me on this podcast with Anthony Munoz, you lit up like a Christmas tree. How much do you know about Anthony and why is this so meaningful for you? Yeah, man. I mean, I, I know a lot, you know, obviously uh, just probably more surface level stuff, but uh, it means so much to me, man, just because of, you know, everything that, you know, my family instilled in me about the left tackle position. And, uh, you know, Anthony Munoz is the greatest to do it. And I think statistically that's proven what he's done on the film shows it, his gold jacket. And, uh, you know, man, given the opportunity to be able to speak to him, I mean, come on, I, it's no deny that I, I was, <laughs> uh, I've been waiting on this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Orlando was born in 1996, a few years after your career ended, but he clearly appreciates the greats that played before him. What does that tell you? Well, you know, it's it's really meaningful. It uh, it's, it's flattering that, uh, you know, he would talk uh, about wanting to meet me, wanting to talk. Uh, you know, I guess it, it really goes to the game. I mean, and I'm much older than him, much, much older. I was older than his dad. But then I look at the guys that, you know, the shoulders I stood on, you know, when I was a kid, I was watching, you know, you know, Art Shell and uh, guys like that. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's great to hear as generations go along that, uh, you know, we can uh, we can think about the guys that played the same position. And I'm flattered and I'm thrilled to, to get a chance to meet the young guy. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I appreciate that, man. That's, you know, I just I personally feel like that's like the humbling part of football is the guys that came before you. You know, even at your university, on the yeah. pro teams you play in, you know, once you get to a certain level in this league, uh, the guys that came before you, you know what I mean? That's who laid out the carpet to give guys an opportunity. And, you know, you being, you know, the type of player you were athletically, height-wise, size-wise, weight-wise, all of that, you know, it's, it's, you're somewhat one of the first. So, um, you know, man, I mean, it's, it's a true honor. Well, Orlando, you know, it's yeah. interesting. So many times we think about the pro game, but you you mentioned a great thing, you know, the guys that came – you know, before us. And, you know, I look at, you know, you played at Oklahoma. I played at USC, two story yep. programs. And I look at the guys that really played before me there, you know, way back in the sixties with Ron Mix, Hall of yep. Fame number, you know, played a lot of years in the NFL, Ron Yeri, first pick oh, of the yeah. draft for the Vikings. And then myself, and then guys after me, like Bruce Matthews and Tony Basile, and you got the same thing going. So, you know, I yep. think it's great that is, you know, young guys that are in the league, and even myself, we continue to keep that sense of history and understand yeah. and see and appreciate what, uh, you know, what the left tackle, what linemen do. And and that's what's fun for me to meet a young guy like yourself that's having a lot of success right now. And uh, to finally say, uh, hey, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, hopefully they bring me back to the preseason because, uh, you know, <laughs> Dan knows I do the preseason games. And I'm sure you guys won't be playing a whole lot in the preseason. But week yeah. number one, I'll uh, you know I'll be watching, and then when the games are at home, I'll be in the stands watching. But that's what's fun yeah. for me. And I tell people, you know, people ask me, "What about the draft? What do you think about the draft?" I said, "You know what? It started for me with the big smile before the draft. The fact that we signed a left tackle, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and that to me, uh, you know, I know number nine uh, had yeah. a big smile. A lot of fans, or but tell you uh, this old yeah. offensive lineman had a big smile when they signed you. Yeah, man. I mean, for me, it was just. You know, coming to be a Bengal, man, it was a clear opportunity. And, you know, money aside, uh, man, I'm all about winning and I'm all about playing the left tackle position to the best of my abilities. And, you know, this was a system under Coach Taylor, Coach Frank Pollock, man, everything that they asked the offensive tackle to do uh, within the system, I feel like was met my standards and, and kind of uh, plays to my strengths as a player. And, you know, I've we've all got our own strengths and weaknesses and Man, I just feel like what what they had to offer in that area. Obviously, with Joe, you know, being at, at the helm at quarterback, I mean, that doesn't make it a tough decision either, man. But uh, it all it all kind of came together, um, you know. But something I really wanted to ask you though was, you know, I, you know, we we all know your accolades, man. You know, eleven time Pro Bowler, All Pro, thirteen years. Like how like how were you able to maintain elite consistency? You know, I, I haven't had the opportunity to make an All Pro yet. I made the last four Pro Bowls the last three at left tackle. And, um, you know, I haven't I haven't necessarily done that yet. And that's my plan this year, you know, to be able to turn that corner and be that guy. But how were you able to maintain that level of consistency throughout your whole career? Well, first of all, I think that's a great goal for you. I mean, the Pro Bowls yeah. are, are great. Uh, you know, yeah. you're one of six, I think, when, when you make the Pro Bowl. When you make All Pro, you're one of two in the entire league. And, you know, yeah. so that is, that's a great goal. For me, 
it was year round, staying consistent, staying in shape, uh, working on my technique. You know, one of the things a lot of people know is that I didn't take a whole lot of time. And this worked for me after my last game to get back into training my body, letting it recover, you know, and going into it slowly. But I'd already achieved a, a high level of conditioning during the season, as you know. I, and you're banged up a little bit, but I continued oh, yeah. right after the season. And I knew that I would go out and I'd lift and I'd run, but I'd also work on my technique in the offseason. Mm -hmm. One of the things I tell young guys, you don't need someone across the line of scrimmage to work on your sets, on your your steps. And and I just drilled that. That was, you know, that was the way I taught. And I know you got an excellent offensive line coach in Frank Pollitt. It's all mm -hmm. about the technique. So, and I had the attitude that, you know, I was a number three pick. I came in, I started on the third day, but I approached every season that I had to earn the job again. I wasn't taking it for yeah. granted. You know, after that first year of starting and the second you're making the Pro Bowl and all, I, I erased that and said, okay, as I enter my off season, I have to go back and earn a job. And that was my whole mentality is that I wanted to work. I wanted to step the volume up in my preparation, get much better in my technique, get in better shape, get stronger. And that's the approach I took. And uh, up until my last year, uh, that uh, I was probably in my going into my year 13, I was a little more banged up, but I was probably in the best shape cardiovascular because I knew as an older player, you had the younger guys nipping at your heels. <laughs> so, uh, and, and just yeah. to share this one story, I'll never forget, we had running tests going into mini camps or, you know, you call them OTAs. And we yeah. had a defensive lineman, Tim Cromwell, who trained like crazy too. Oh, yeah. uh, so we had to do a half mile and a mile. And, you know, we had like eight and a half minutes. And I looked at Tim and I said, there's no way we're going to take the full eight and a half. And we busted out and all the young guys said, what are you guys doing? Well, first of all, we wanted to, to really, by example, show them the work ethic. But then on the other hand, I needed to show the coaches that I could still make that half mile, that mile under a certain amount of time. So I think that's the example that especially offensive linemen set for not only other linemen, but for the team is that, you know, as you know, we don't get all the notoriety, but we can set the pace, the tempo about how we prepare, how we work. And that's how I was trained at USC. And that was really the approach I took until year 13. Yeah, definitely. I, I feel that, you know, wholeheartedly, man. I, you know, that's somewhat, you know, I don't want to say a, a forgotten or untold part of the game, but it's one of the most important, you know, I think a lot of times, man, being in it now, you know, being in the sport so often, you know, for me, and I don't know how it was for you, but, you know, you see a lot of guys that are talented that don't necessarily love the game. And, you know, they kind of lose out on uh, their abilities to to be able to maximize and, you know, what they can be and, and who they can be as players. And, you know, that was something that I always heard early on was, you know, how important your work ethic was and, and training all those different things. I, you know, I, it's something that I've personally gotten better with throughout, throughout my career. Uh, just because, you know, immaturities or whatever reasons coming out. Uh, you know, I've always a, was a hard worker. That's how I earned my job but in, in college. But, um, you know, man, it's, it's crazy you say that. I, I remember, uh, you know, quick little story for me. I remember, man, I want to say it's it's right around in July of 2015. I think you did a TED talk or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. man, it was, it was, you talked about moving forward. You know, your mom, your mom, uh, you know, encouraging you to move forward. And, uh, you know, that was something that really hit home with me, you know, because it was just such a deep message, uh, you know, as somebody obviously that looks up to you, uh, even then, you know, more so now uh, being in this position. But, um, you know, man, that's that's something that that I've kind of always went back to in my mind was, you know, the mindset and mentality of that. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. as we talk about that, you know, one of the phrases that I get a little I don't really care for. I know a lot of guys talk about a chip on their shoulder. I, I don't yeah. believe in that because to me. When you look at it, that you have a chip on a shoulder, that has a tendency to take your focus away from your job. If you look at it that this is just a job I have, and I'm going to make those people, the Brown family or whoever, you know, make them believe they made the right choice. That's a that's it. I could have gone into my my draft and said, you know, I got a chip on my shoulder because nobody said I'd get drafted. I missed, but I didn't look at it that way. I looked at it. This is my opportunity. This is my job. I want to keep this job as long as I can at the highest level. And I really believe if you start talking about a chip on your shoulder, and I've heard other guys use that, that it really takes your focus off what you have to do. And it puts your focus on those that you want to, that you want to say, hey, look at what I can do more than like, I got to do my job. And this is what I'm going to do to help the team to be the best, first of all, the best player, 
the best team player. And uh, mm-hmm. when, and I'll share this real quick. You know, we know this is a team sport. And when I share a lot, I say the only time I was selfish in this team sport was in the off season. I was selfish to get myself as strong as possible in the best shape and work on my technique. That's the only time I was selfish. Once I hit the field with my teammates, it was all about team. And, and that's the approach I took. And I think that's what allowed me to play at such a high level uh, for such a long time. Yeah, man, I love that, man. I, uh, you know, I've always been curious, you know, obviously just watching so much film of you and, and knowing your story. Uh, and, you know, this might be a little deep, but, you know, talk to me a little bit about like your mindset, your standard come Sundays, uh, you know, and obviously that preparation starts, as you're saying, in the off season in training camp with the guys, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, the whole spill. But, you know, talk to me a little bit about, like, your state of mind on Sundays. Yeah. Well, okay, so first of all, you have three or four days of practice before your game. I always looked at that as my preparation. That was my – that was getting ready for my final exam. You have however many plays on Sunday, but think about all the reps you have leading up to Sunday. Reps to work on what – once you've studied the guy you're playing against, what am I going to use against him? What's going to work? And then working on that all week and believing in that. So I enjoyed all the reps that I took during the week. If it was, you know, a thud or full speed for us or even a walkthrough, I believe you can get better in a walkthrough. You know, Absolutely. if you're past that, don't just get out of your stance. Do what you do in, you know, in full speed, but you're not hitting anybody. Not that you have to, you know, blow everything out in a walkthrough but you can get better in a walkthrough. So that was my whole mindset. And then come Saturday, we review. And I'll never forget Jim McNally, who coached me, was along the lines of Frank Paul. Jim would come up to me and he goes, now you've worked on this. You got to believe in it and trust it. I said, yep, here's the technique that I believe is going to work. And you just, you go with it. And that was my whole mindset. And I think a lot of the mindset goes back to my freshman year in college. And it's interesting um, I retired in a, a year after we retired, we moved, we built another house and we moved. I found my freshman playbook from USC. I mean, you're talking <laughs> 17 years after my freshman year and I opened it up and the first page, and this is kind of the attitude I had the first page, all it said in block letters was dominate. And then you turn the second page and it says, we will dominate from the first play. And by the fourth quarter, they will give in. And that's kind of, you know, with our whole mindset was finish, 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 and just setting the te- – once you get in and you believe and you trust what you're going to do, now the guy across from you, after the first several plays, you want him saying, oh, this is going to be a long afternoon. This is you know, be a long afternoon. And that was the whole – and it might not. You know, we all get beat. We've all gotten beat. But to keep it to a minimum, but have him believe that it's going to be a long afternoon. That's kind of how I built up to when I played on Sunday. Yeah, no, man, I feel like that definitely showed, you know, I, uh, man, I've, I can't tell you how much I, how many games I watched, but man, I mean, you had so many battles, you know, obviously with, I mean, some of the best to ever play the game, like Bruce Smith, man, um, LT, I think you caught him a little bit in there. I remember watching some stuff on him, but man, I mean, just your approach and, you know, sometimes, you know, as you said, man, you know, you, you will get beat, but I think, man, the one thing you really had about your game that was crazy was your recovery. You know what I mean? It's like, Man, a guy may look like he has the edge, but somehow, some way, you got your feet and hips back in front of this guy and boomer sizing. You know what I mean? It's, it's insane. You know what I mean? How you were able to do those type of things, man. Are those for you? Were those considered like practice techniques? Was that more of a mindset for you? You know, obviously, because, man, I, I personally, you know, I understand that if I'm setting a DN and I'm using my inside hand and I feel his shoulder come to me and I can't pose, pose back, I'm going to, I'm trained to spin. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've trained my muscle memory to I'm going to spin here. If I miss with my inside hand and I know he spins inside, I'm spinning with the spinner, you know, and, and I see you do that sometimes, whether you're playing a Bruce Smith and, you know, maybe you miss with the first punch and, you know, you, you feel like he's got an edge, but somehow you get back in front of him. You know what I mean? Is that a train habit? Is that, you know, just similar for you? Muscle memory? Like, it's how muscle does that work for you? Trained. I mean, it's all the above. It's, it's stuff that... Yeah. You just got to keep going and do whatever it is, you know. And I would think because they put us at left tackle that they believe we're athletic enough to move out in space. And that's the approach oh, yeah. I took. If I, you know, if I did get in that position, you know, one of the things I would do, you know, God bless me with the, you know, big rear end. So why not? You know, I played basketball in high school. I couldn't jump, but I yeah. got a lot of rebounds because I used 
my body and I, and I knew where the ball was going. So I used my posterior end. So why not? Yeah. If you feel you kind of, you know, turn, spin and then recover. But that's the whole thing we worked on. And I was thankful that I had that ability to recover the recoverability. Uh, but it's, yeah. again, when you talk about that, what does it boil down to? Attitude. Attitude of regardless of what position you're in, you got to finish the block. You got to yep. finish it however you can. I love that, dog. I love that, man. I, uh, you know, who who would you say is the best best defense end you played throughout your career? Probably the best all around. You mentioned him, Bruce Smith. I mean, I I could yeah. go down the line, probably give you ten guys that uh, yeah, amazing. But the total yeah. package was probably Bruce Smith. I mean, size, speed, length, you know, smarts. Uh, and it was obvious because they could talk him over the nose and he could play inside with his size just as effective. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think I, I think there's about a half dozen guys I played my career that are in the Hall of Fame. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, oh, no doubt. Yeah, so no doubt. I caught guys <laughs> early in their career like Bruce. And then I caught guys late in their career like Elvin Bethea with the Oilers and Cedric Hart. Oh, yeah. You yep. know, guys like that. And then there's some guys that don't get enough credit. Like, you know, you had Howie Long on one side of the Raiders, but then you had Greg Townsend. The guy was amazing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, Clyde Simmons and, you know, Sean yeah. Jones and Fred Dean, oh, yeah. and Leroy Man. Selman. I saw Leroy Selman twice in the first five weeks of my rookie year. And I'm thinking, <laughs> holy smokes, welcome to the NFL, you know. That's <laughs> awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably one of the <laughs> nicest guys you'd ever meet, but one of the yeah. toughest competitors and the – one of he's probably in my top five, and uh, I yeah. saw twice re- uh, preseason, and then opening up my rookie year, I'm thinking, okay, here we go, NFL, time to strap it up. Oh man, that's the best though. Another like compete against greats. I, uh, you know, so some I did want to ask you though was, uh, you know, man, are there any regrets that you have in your career? Um, you know, whether that be, uh, you know, I it's personal, you know what I mean, but just as far as with family, uh, as far as with what happened on the field or, you know, anything like that, you know, obviously, cause you, you know, you, you're a hall of famer, you know, and you, you were the greatest to ever do it at the position. And, uh, you know, I'm just curious, man, you know, no one man is perfect. So you right. know, I'm we're just curious. Nobody yeah. is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but I can say that I was taught, I had a lot of great mentors. I was taught to prioritize things. And like I said, my workout was, you know, that was it, but, you know, really deciding to, to prioritize my life, with my wife, my kids, and my football. And, and I really believe the way I was taught, I was able to do that. I was able to put everything I could into football, but at the same time, you know, I was able to, to really make my family a priority. So um, as far as regrets, maybe I didn't uh, learn to pass rush and I couldn't rush Montana on that 92-yard drive that when they beat us <laughs> Super Bowl. Maybe that, that's the only regret, man. You know, you know, wish I, I had the spin or you know up and under the the swipe to yeah. get in there and maybe tackle them on third and long. We win the Super Bowl, but no, you know, Orlando. I can really say that I I really don't have any great regrets uh, as far as the game itself. Uh, yeah. You know, I felt like I gave it everything uh, when I could, uh, and yeah. I was uh, you know that was one of the things after uh, you know only playing one healthy season at USC. I wanted to play ten plus years. And every time I put the uniform on, I wanted to be next to my guys. And I was able to yeah. do that for just about my entire 13 years with the Bengals. Man, that's awesome, man. I Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful thing, man. You, That's that's so cool. Um, I also wanted to ask you, too, about, you know, just some of your relationships with some of your left guards that you played next to, man. I know you didn't play next to many, I would I believe, did. as a Bengal. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, just, just I'm just curious on – you know, your relationships with, with some of these guys, um, you know what I mean? Just how how far they are, you know, are you still friends with them? You know, how was it when you guys were playing? How much time was spent together? Like, you know, I'm just, you know, just curious. Yeah, no, I, that's a great question. Yeah. And, you know, and I tell people, unlike the game that, uh, nowadays, when I tell people I played 13 years with the Bengals and had one line coach, they're like, what? <laughs> and crazy. I played – and Dan might have the stats, but I think I played next to Bruce Reimers for like seven or eight years, maybe yeah, no six or seven. I played next to Dave Lapham for four, who we're yep. still best of buds. I mean, you know Lap. Lap, Lap is the man. man. He's my guy, man. You know, when I got no inducted, doubt. when I got in, I took Dave Lapham to my hometown in Southern California when they did all these things for me at home when I was getting inducted. And they said, we'd like for you to bring one teammate. And I had, I could have chose a bunch of them, but I took Lap. So I played my first four years next to Lap and about maybe six or seven next to Bruce Reimers. And, uh, of course, he always stayed in Iowa. 
Uh, I've seen them a couple of times since they started bringing guys back, but I'm sure we get together and it's like we haven't missed a beat. And then a couple other yeah. guys, you know, Bruce Kazerski, who played guard center, they're still in town. So we yeah. still have a lot of the guys that I played with. Uh, and really, the only guys, Bruce Reimer stayed in Iowa, so I don't see him a whole lot. But uh, we communicate now and then. And uh, it was it was amazing because, as you know, I mean, that left guard, it, it means everything. You know, not only that, Absolutely. Line, especially that left guard. And to be able to play next to two guys for the majority of my career, I feel really blessed and uh, fortunate to be able to do that. Man, I hear you, man. I, you know, we, I, cause you know, I just, just coming off a of Super Bowl with Joe Tooney out there in KC and we spent the last two years together before that for me, it was Marshall Yonda in Baltimore on the right side a little bit. Uh, man, just that bond that's created, you know, when you're in battle with that guy for a yeah. whole game yeah. and it's just you two versus another two set of men whose families and loyalty and all this stuff is on the line. And, you know, man, just that bond and relationship that's created with the battle, man, I, just always curious, you know, just about the, you know, transition of the game and, and kind of how that goes. Um, well, that's great. Now I got a young left yeah. tackle, young left guard. We can see you and Volson next to each other for eight, nine, ten years. So, that man, is- that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> that's that the plan, man. Number nine there for about another, you know, 10, 15 and have you guys on the left side. And, you know, we're, we're fine. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt, man. Uh, last question for you. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we got much time, but uh, last question for you, man. Um, you know, I like, I did a little bit of dive into you a little bit, you know, obviously like growing up and stuff. And, you know, I just was always curious, you know, being a Mexican-American, uh, you know, man, just kind of like what you experienced. Because, you you know, growing up in California, uh, I'm guessing, you know, during the 70s, man, it had to, or, you know, late 60s and 70s had to be, you know, somewhat different. So, you know, I just was curious on the type of culture and, and, and people you grew up around. You know, I had a great upbringing. Uh, I lived in a really mm-hmm. diverse area. And you're right, yep. 60s and 70s out in L.A. Were, were not the greatest. But I lived in a part just east of L.A., about 40 miles. And, I mean, there was three of us. We were like the three musketeers, and we'd go to each other's house. I had a, a white guy, a black guy, and a brown guy. The three of us, man, we played yep. baseball together. And I think, I think I'd think i have to say a little biased. They probably enjoyed my mom's homemade tortillas more than the other food. But, <laughs> you know, we, we, we used to go to each other's house, eat, you know, have – meals with each other we used to hang out so it was pretty diverse and my high school was pretty diverse so I was fortunate growing up you know my whole family's from Mexico I I was born in the states but uh you know always been proud of of the culture and uh, trying to represent the you know the Latino you know community and it's been important because I hear a lot of feedback you know because uh, especially as you get more you know the Latinos playing in the NFL uh guys uh you know watching you and and stuff as they're growing up but, uh, yeah, so the culture was pretty cool. I, I had a great upbringing. Uh, you know, it wasn't the best. You know, we didn't have a whole lot, but it didn't matter. Yeah. As long as I had, you know, my family and school and sports, I, I was set, man. It just yeah. – the summertime, I played baseball all summer. Uh, you know, then I got to high school and started playing some football along with baseball and basketball. But uh, things went pretty well. I, you know, I never experienced um, any pushback, anything uh, that, uh, you know, affected me, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, people really – you know, being any different uh, to me. So it was good yeah. that I grew up where I did. And then I came back here. It was a little different when I got to Cincinnati. Uh, couldn't find any Mexican food, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> a lot of people are going crazy about Taco Bell. And there's a restaurant here, Dan. You probably, I don't know if Dan's even old, but Chi Chi's. They had a restaurant called Chi Oh, Chi-Chi. yeah. <laughs> I remember Chi Chi's from back in the day. Absolutely. <laughs> Orlando, you like this since you asked me a question. The first mistake I made when I got to Cincinnati. One of my first interviews, because we looked all over for Mexican food, I said, the only, one of the only things I love, as soon as we got to Cincinnati, I fell in love with Cincinnati. I mean, it oh, was, same. but I, I, in the interview, I said, I have one problem. I can't find any good salsa. And I can't. <laughs> and so that was a mistake because after that article came out, every restaurant I went into, the, the cook came out with salsa. It was a oh, Japanese, <laughs> Japanese steakhouse, steakhouse. It did Italian. They came out with salsa. Here, try this. You know, you got to um, smile. And say, okay, but uh, you know, as time went by, we got more some pretty good Mexican food. But uh, yeah, so it was. I enjoyed growing up in my culture, and and you know, really uh, had no problems with it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I, that's you know, it's crazy you talk about Cincinnati. That's like the best part of being here, man. Is the love in the city. You know oh, what I mean? It's yeah. it's you know you, you know how much they love their football. You know how important it is to them and. 
you know, that that same energy is reciprocated, man, from within and myself and, and yourself. So, man, I, I'm so thankful for, you know, you taking some time to talk to me and everything, man. I really appreciate you. Love it. I, I, when, yes, Dan, uh, when Dan uh, contacted me and asked, I said, I'd love to do this. I want to meet the guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, now, now I know I'll be, you know, mm. rooting, even if I hadn't met you, I'd be rooting you on. But uh, yeah. I don't get down there a whole lot until camp. But uh, yeah. I'll pop my head in there now and then. Be the preseason. If they ask me back to do the broadcast, I'll be back. But uh, I'll, I'll watch you. I'll be watching you, and hopefully, we can go out and grab a bite to eat uh, down the road yeah. here. We can have some time. Yes, sir, man. I love to. I appreciate you, man. Thank uh, you. Hey, thank you, and Dan, thank you for setting this up. Dan, yeah, Dan has all my information. He, you can pass it on to you, my my cell, okay. my email, and stuff, and uh, maybe we can connect uh, down the road here. Okay, perfect, man. Dan, I really appreciate you, dog. Thank you. Hey, this has been great. I feel like I was a fly on the wall when a friendship was formed. <laughs> hey. No doubt. No. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, hey, guys, thanks so much for your time. I know uh, the listeners will really enjoy this conversation. Look forward to seeing you t- two guys together uh, during training camp at some point when Anthony's on the field. That'll be yep, great. Yes, sir. Thank you, Orlando. Pleasure, man. Great yes. talking to you. Yes, sir. Pleasure as well. Thank you. Have a great night. All right. That was phenomenal. Thank you, gentlemen. Right. Yeah. Really appreciate both of you. Yeah. All right. I appreciate you, dog. Right, you have a great night. Okay. Thank have a good you. night. Okay. So right. long. Okay. Bye-bye. All right.